to your episode 308 of the At Percussion Podcast. My name is Ben Charles, and with me, as always, are Carly Vigna. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Hey, Carly. Doing well. Good to see you at PASIC. Yeah. And excellent performance of Mark Applebaum's Aphasia. It was really cool getting to sit oh. out in that huge ballroom watching you play that. It's like you're famous oh, thanks up there. So much. <laughs> thanks so much. Sorry I didn't get a chance to hear you play. I wish I could have made it. It's all right. Yeah, so... It's just PASIC being PASIC. Uh, Carly and I have a friend, Brian Calhoun, who was scheduled on the three o'clock. I was on the four o'clock and Carly ended up on the five o'clock. Long story there. So I couldn't see either, but uh, Brian and I were both able to see Carly, luckily. So, <laughs> And returning from a hiatus for a, a world tour, Ksenia, welcome back. Hello. Thank you for having me back. How was your, uh, your mostly Russian, all Russian tour? Mostly Russian and a uh, little field trip to Poland also. Nice. Everything go well? Everything went beautifully. Bardzo dobrze. Ocien harasho. I learned how to speak both languages. It's amazing. <laughs> um, no, it was, it was really lovely. Such generous audiences, wonderful people to play with, wonderful students. I mean, they're, those people over there in Europe, we're going to talk about this with our guests, but you know, they put something in, in their breakfast. There's something wrong. It's not good. <laughs> I don't want to go against those 15 year olds, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love seeing some little, a few little clips popped up here and there of you playing. Uh, so welcome back, Ksenia. And we have a special announcement. Uh, we have a new co-host. He's been here before, but he's officially uh, a permanent member of the roster now. Welcome, Caleb Pickering, to the podcast. Hey, it's good to be here on a more permanent basis. Yeah. So and then uh, Casey is still involved in the podcast, but Casey will probably mostly be working behind the, sing the, the scenes on things like the podcast site and uh, some Instagram work and stuff like that. But Casey is still around. So don't worry, Casey is alive and well. Uh, and we are recording this on November 21st and releasing it on December 2nd. Carly, what happened on December 2nd in history? Yeah, December 2nd was a pretty good day, actually. So on December 2nd, 1937, it was the birthday of American composer Catherine Hoover. Um, anybody ever hear of her? No, me no. neither. I, I hadn't either. So Hoover grew up in West Virginia and then later Philadelphia, and she went on to earn a performer certificate in flute and bachelor's of music theory from Eastman. And then she got her master's degree from Manhattan School of Music. And she had somewhat of, of a difficult time as a composition student. She's quoted as saying of her time in school, there were no women involved with composition at all. I got rather discouraged being the only woman in my classes, not being a paid attention to and so forth. Um, so I think she had a, a tough time, especially starting out there. She ended up being on the faculty of MSM for 15 years and she taught flute at Juilliard Prep and then taught composition and flute at the Teachers College of Columbia University. Um, she founded her own publishing press called Papagena in 1990 where she published her own works and the first piece that her publishing company put out was her own flute solo, Coco Pelli which was a work for solo flute inspired by the Hopi tribe and the American Southwest. And it won the National Flute Association's newly published music competition in 1991. Um, and I found this really wonderful quote about Catherine Hoover and her music from uh, composer John Corleano, who we talked about on the show quite a bit before. And he said of her, Catherine Hoover is an extraordinary composer. She has a wide and fascinating vocabulary, which she uses with enormous skill. Her music is fresh and individual. It is dazzlingly crafted and will reach an audience as it provides interest to the professional musician. I do not know why her works are not yet being played by the major institutions of this country, but I am sure that she will attain the status she deserves in time. She is just not, uh, she is, excuse me, she is just too good not to be recognized. And I predict that her time will come soon. Um, she didn't write a whole, whole lot for percussion, but there is percussion in several of her orchestral works and some mixed chamber ensembles too. So if you feel inspired today to check out some of Catherine Hoover's music, that would be nice on the anniversary of her birthday. And then there's one more uh, on December 2nd, 1943. It was the premiere of Carmen Jones. Anybody know about this Broadway musical? No. 
Cool. I found two two new ones. I didn't know about this either. It's a it's a Broadway musical adaptation of Bizet's Carmen, the opera. Um, the music was orchestrated for Broadway by Robert Russell Bennett, and the lyrics and the book were by Oscar Hammerstein, the second of Rodgers and Hammerstein fame. Um, Carmen Jones adapts the original opera to a World War II era African American setting with an all black cast, which was a big deal on Broadway in 1943. Um, the original Broadway production starred Muriel Smith and Muriel Ron, who were alternating in the title role. And Robert Shaw was the one who prepared the chorus for the show. So since 1943, the musical has been revived in London in 1991, and then again in 2007. And then there was an off-Broadway revival in New York City in 2018, so pretty recently. And I found a CD. There's a CD available on Amazon of a 1962 studio recording of the songs from the show. So I'd be pretty curious to hear that. Awesome. Great job, Carly. I hadn't heard of either of those things. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it was a good day for history. Yeah. Well, let's use this time to welcome our guest today, Manuel Loyenberger. Manuel is a uh, Swiss marimist extraordinaire. He uh, is an award-winning performer. He's often been featured as a concerto soloist, including the premiere of Emmanuel Sejourné's Magellan Concerto for multi-percussion and string orchestra. He's been published by Edition Spitzer. He is a Marimba One artist, and he was my roommate in graduate school, <laughs> most importantly. So welcome to the podcast, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction so and for you. the in invitation. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Even though it's, it's been quite a while. Just, yeah, yeah. And uh, thanks for the invention of the internet. It's uh, good to see you <laughs> at least this way. And who, who knows? Um, I, I hope so that this will be possible again in a more personal uh setting uh like you know in real in real life <laughs> just a, a quick anecdote about manu and my history so carly and i got to miami a year before manu but uh he and i had been in touch and and uh he was moving into the place where i was living my my second year and there was a hurricane that was supposed to hit miami and so like school oh, yeah. got canceled we all went over to carly's place and we were just hanging out and i was like well there's no way this Swiss guy is going to touch down in the middle of a hurricane, and he did. And I think that's like oh, the I... most appropriate introduction to this guy just came in in a hurricane and just like didn't stop from there. So I forgot about that, about that one. Yeah, You're right. I was I was flying uh, Zurich, Düsseldorf, Düsseldorf, uh, Miami, and in Düsseldorf they even said they don't know if if. if they hope everything works out yeah you're right that was yeah oh wow and then i remember <laughs> on his uh his graduate recital he played hurricane's eye which just seems so so appropriate yeah. after that introduction <laughs> but uh, also Manu T go ahead sorry sorry also in the t-shirt i mean i was so happy that that the the football team of uh you know our campus was hurricanes yeah or was it baseball excuse me and so I had this T-shirt with Hurricane on it, playing Hurricane's Eye. <laughs> was cool. I remember that. Uh, but Manu, to, to sort of get into the thick of things here a little bit, uh, many young people have an interest in playing the marimba as a career, but the journey to supporting yourself as an artist is often less clear cut than most, if not uh, other career choices. So uh, you've mentioned that the playing side of things is taught very well in schools, but often the business side is less taught or not taught at all. So what have been some of those important business side discoveries that you've made on your journey? So um, what, what I did, uh, the whole business side is actually right now happening, or let's say for the last maybe three years, because after Miami, I came back to Switzerland and I was this, okay, let's go with the marimba and, and make a marimba school, the a Swiss, Swiss marimba school. I don't know, but um, the, there, there was no plan. There was just, you know, this, you have to, you have to play more concerts in order to get, get more concerts. And um, it was always when people asked me, what is your goal? I would say, play more concerts, but that's actually not a goal. That's, that's called a wish. And, um, well, I maybe I can come to that later. But um, what happened is that I needed to face reality after after studying, um, after mastering the, the or not mastering. I'm still 
practicing. But <laughs> uh, I mean, in school, in when you study music, you learn all that stuff. But as you as you said, or as I feel, um, you don't. You do. Learn you do have a master's degree, so technically you have mastered. I think that's fair. Yes. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, but that that's really good. I mean, they teach that really well, depending on on what level, what what school. Um, um, in my personal opinion, the school is not the biggest factor. You can study at Yale, you can study uh, wherever, but in the end, it's you who has to do the practicing and the learning. But so what I needed to do is what some people, I, I don't wish it to everybody, but some people need that. They need to hit rock bottom. And in my case, that was a, um, well, a, a big challenge, getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And then um, I started doubting music and I was close to quitting and I went to, to uh, work at Zurich airport. Actually, I had, you know, the, the whole dress and everything and I would work at the gate and I would leave the music to work 85%, almost full time at an airport. And this is where I met some, some very interesting people and also my, my whole, um, how do you say? not business life, but everything around it started to change. And I started to miss the marimba again. That was maybe a good thing. And, and then I got to know people who work in other jobs than music, but they do have their own, their own business. So I started to just stop treating music as an art per se, and starting to, to treat it like I want to, I have a product, let's say it's Ben's uh, very great looking cakes he makes. I mean, I saw them on Facebook, they look delicious. Let's say you want to sell them. What do you do? You need to know what your product is. In my case, it's marimba music. And then you need to know who's your client, who's, who's going to, who's going to buy your product. And that's what I never learned in while studying. So um, what I did was uh, just last week, actually, I took a class. I, I went, I drove for an hour with my car, which is a long time in Switzerland. We never drive long, long, long distances. And um, so this class was called, how do you get your product to the customer? So I'm, I'm doing exactly that now. So it, it took me, I, I got my master's degree. I mastered playing music at age 26, but it took me all the way to now 33 to realize that I have a product and I want to sell it. So I'm learning now. Um, I did not want to go study an MBA or, or a business, business master. I just do it um, as a side project. I talk to people and I take little workshops where I learn how to how to pitch, how to write emails, how to all this business stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a really wonderful of you to share. And I, that takes a lot of uh, courage and vulnerability. And I think it's still a part of most people's process. I would say I had a very similar experience. I didn't get to work a, at an airport though, but I, after getting my doctorate and artist diploma, I ended up uh, going to Hong Kong for a year to teach general music, which I thought was great because my wish was, okay, all I want is a job in music anywhere on this planet. And what I wanted is exactly what I got. And it was amazing in so many ways, but it absolutely felt emotionally like a complete failure and a disaster because I think it's the same. I went from being in this sort of incubator where all I thought about was the spiritual value of music and how I can make it better and how to be altruistic. And then all of a sudden I was dumped in a place that is all about business and, you know, it's five o'clock. I'm not going to care anymore to do any more work and money and surrounded by that kind of um, people. It was really shocking. Um, but yes, I think people do need to think about how are they going to make music work for them? And how are they going to stop having shame around money and learn mm -hmm. how to make money? Because 
I think a lot of us do experience that. Um, and also what I think is really important, and I talk to my students about this without wanting to ever scare them, but I think the time after graduating is perhaps the most difficult emotional time, uh, financial time for a musician. It used to be that you might get a job straight out of school. And I think it's very rare when people do get a, I mean, for those who are going for like jobs, jobs. For other folks, it is an absolute like 180 degrees because you might end up doing something that has nothing to do with music and that might cause you to doubt yourself and so on. But Ben has a saying that he loves to repeat and I'll let him say this. It's about how walls are there to test people, not prevent them from things. <laughs> right, Ben? Yeah, it's uh, walls or brick walls are there to let you prove how bad you want something, something like that. Yeah. 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 So I, I think uh, it's really important to talk about this. And I would suggest that students go to their teachers and ask for very specific career advice and openness. This is something that I really try to do. Um, and I think we all need to get over this idea of creating like a, a smoke curtain around us pretending like we're busier than we are so that we'd get more busy. What Manu said about, you know, want more concerts. So in order to get more concerts, you need to seem like you have a lot of concerts. It's like this catch 22. Um, but just be very open and honest about, okay, how do you pitch gigs? How do you seek for things? And that's totally okay. I want to play for people. Even if people don't want to hear me, I'm gonna play for you. <laughs> Yeah, the, the idea of having a business plan, I think, sounds so unartistic. Uh, and it's something that yeah. it, talking about money is tacky in Western cultures, so and we don't like to do it. But um, the amount of times I've heard a student say, well, after I graduate, I want to move to I want to move to Nashville and just gig, man. It's like, that's great. How are you going to get your first gig? <laughs> How are you going to yeah. support yourself until the gigs start coming in? So I you know, totally get that. Um, well, Manu, speaking of like the business side of things, I know you've also, so to speak, diversified your portfolio beyond just being a performer, including you mentioned you did music production for a magician and you play at retirement yeah. homes. So how did you get into these gigs and how have they informed your career path? Um, thank you. Great question. So what I did um, after, yeah, no, after you hit rock bottom, usually you're weak, but uh, after I regained some strength, um, what, what happened is also... When you have, you know, that, that song, I don't know by whom, and I just know this melody, uh, little to win, but nothing to lose. It's an old, I don't know. It's just, that happened to me. There was um, all this, this shame, everything was just gone mostly. And also the shyness because people don't think that a lot of me, but I'm actually super shy when it comes to selling myself or pitching. But what no I one wants to ask for talk, money. Yeah. <laughs> no, and no one wants to look. I have no problem telling you. I know a super marimba player. Ask this guy; he's amazing. Ask her; she's amazing. But telling somebody that you're you sell yourself are amazing. That's just in every culture. Some cultures are different than others, but it's still difficult. Anyway, what I did um, was just talk to everybody. And this magician gig, actually, I'm so so glad that you. You ask that because that was one of my highlights in 2021. And it was just what I also learned is some things take a long time because it was many years ago that I um, I was at a, let's call it a very, very, very small PASIC, but not only for music. It's What do you call that? A convention. Yeah. Um, in Switzerland, it's for, for small, it's like, arts, um, people who are about to, you know, get some of them become famous, some of them just, it's uh, where people meet to pitch. So there was this magician, and I was just very fond of him because I love magic. That's also why I love the marimba, because I often feel like it sounds a little bit magical. And um, what happened was two years ago, I got to make a show with this same magician. So I asked him, would you like to make a program with marimba and live and magic? And also we added a tap dancer. That was a crazy performance. We had a tap dancer, marimba and live magic. Um, and this, this way I also, um, I learned that, wow, you can actually ask 
famous people because this magician he he won a world championship he was asked to perform in las vegas full time and um he's he is like what i want to be one day i don't know career wise so i was shy to talk to him but then i got to play with him perform on the same stage and i realized it's 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 just a very dedicated human and i can talk to him and then he said um that this was a one once in a lifetime show he doesn't want to continue because he has his own stuff going on and i thought oh wh what a pity that's that's that and then all of a sudden this year because of because of the pandemic he um couldn't couldn't perform so he's not only a magician who does card tricks he does actually he composes his own magic illusions and um he said well he could have taken any open source music for free you know that's our our biggest enemy out there the the music that's for free and he said no he wants to have a a real production and it's so cool he has this one um thing where where he performs with physical objects but also he has a a beamer and he has a screen and he interacts with the screen so he had a four minute um, number he wanted to perform and I got to compose. I, I didn't compose, I didn't write down notes, but I just, I came up with an idea and he loved it. And now he's using this for the whole next year. So every show he's playing, there will be music created by me. And, and, and then um, of course, what was really difficult is he asked how much? <laughs> And then I had to put a number on that. And that's also difficult because you learn that if you don't have a diploma, you can't ask too much. But that's just not true. So I said, if the music is good and I'm a real musician, then it's going to cost something. <laughs> so that was that was something that was really fun. And the the other question, the retirement homes, that's actually an old idea that I am now re revamping, <laughs> um, redoing again with um, an assistant for the first time in my life. I have a telesales, a tele, sorry, telesales um, person. She does that all her life long. I gave her a thousand bucks, like down payment to do 20 hours of phone calls. And now she just calls all the retirement homes in Switzerland. And uh, I'm not the first one to have this idea. But it's actually brilliant because what do we have right now on this planet? A lot of old people. And what do they love? They love marimba. So that's that's what we do now. And um, I love this. This is and this I don't is be a clip. <laughs> and I don't and I don't feel dirty because of it, because it's a win-win situation. I love to play. They have nowhere to go. Let's be honest, old folks' homes are sometimes really, um, yeah, it's, it's not a fun place to be in sometimes. So um, that's really something that's starting now. And I'm so happy this tele, um, this uh, woman who's doing the phone calls, she started just last week. And after the first day, she said, okay, Manuel, now you have six emails to write, like six, six retirement homes who are already at least interested. Let's see if I can close the deal. So that's really, really new. And it took also a lot of courage to do that, but it's, yeah, it's fun. I was gonna say the, the return on investment sounds interesting. Like I, it, it makes sense like career-wise, but like, I'm gonna put down a thousand dollars here like lay down a thousand dollars on the line for 20 hours of work from you. Like, cause I'm not going to make 20 hours of phone call and you know, yeah, seeing what exactly. you get back from that. It's yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And um, it's good. It's, it's, it's what, what I see in other musicians and what I see in myself, we are terrible. Not maybe not you, but I'm just gonna, gonna broad stroke it here. We are terrible at outsourcing. Oh, let me just, let me just make a transcription. No worries, I can do a recording. Oh yeah, I also need to cook, to sleep and to drive my car and get gasoline. And 
let me do that myself. I mean, this is not, no business in this world works that way. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't see Tim Cook going to, 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 to uh, what's his name? Yeah, anyway, Apple, Tim Cook. Let's take Elon Musk. I don't see him putting the screws into his Teslas. It's just, I, I'm thinking, I still love music. This is my thing. I don't want to be a sellout. That's the big, the big bad word. But I, I just realized that this does not, it does not work with a one man show. Yeah. So that's my new approach to music. I do the music and somebody else do, does the phone calls. <laughs> Backing up just a little bit, I wanted to mention one thing because we were talking about marimba playing and magic. And uh, has anyone heard the piece Houdini's Last Trick? I watched oh, Lee the Howard Stevens levitate a table off stage, and I I thought I had died and gone to another realm. <laughs> yeah. So wait, what? Like, we're, like Lee Howard Stevens is apparently into magic, and he has a piece called Houdini's Last Trick, and I've never title. seen it live, and I want to. And Caleb, like, there's some illusion he does at the end where he like levitates a table. I don't know. He but levitates there, there's a an table. Unlisted there's an unlisted stage. clip on on YouTube of it, but if you go to the like Malatech website and you find this piece, Houdini's Last Trick, it has a a, a clip of the performance on there. Uh, but yeah, it's like so, so so such a weird thing. So anyway, if you're into magic and marimba playing, check that out. But Caleb, I think you had something. Yeah, um, actually, part of it was that. Yeah, yeah, seeing Lee Stevens move a table with his mind off that dude's a, that dude's a witch. Um, but, but back to, but back to that's, that's the clip right there. Yeah. <laughs> Lee Howard Cynic, Stevens, that dude's a wish. <laughs> but it seems like, um, in the past, uh, I guess about three years, you've done a whole lot of interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, collaborations and a lot of duo work for concerts. Um, can you speak a little to kind of the, the results you get from doing say just a solo marimba concert versus when you pull out you know, a sax and marimba concert or marimba tap dancer, uh, things like that. And some of those challenges, challenges that are in there. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. It's, it's, I love chamber music. Um, I think that's partially also, uh, what, what type of teacher you learn with. I mean, Katarzyna Michka was one of my first international, um, you know, like somebody who's really internationally playing. And then Svet Stoyanov, of course, he's big into chamber music. I got to play with Carly. It was a really, I learned so much. Also, you can learn so much from other people's skills. I played with Ben. Um, we had, I mean, making music together for me is still the best thing that can happen. Um, the solo playing, is just much simpler when it comes to find a date when you can play, you can just go to your car and play. But with the duo, it's always, um, you can broaden your horizon by playing with as many instruments as you possibly can. Even a tap dancer who is basically a percussionist with his feet. I also love to explore uh, marimba and organ which is um, now happening more and more, as I see throughout the world. This is really something that people get hooked to now. And um, unfortunately, the, the duo with the saxophone player has a little bit, well, not stopped, but right now we're not doing many concerts, but I have a new duo actually. And we finally found a name for it so we could register for a, a website. It's uh, uh, of course only in, in German. But uh, we're called the Acoustic Voyagers, and um, it's a clarinet and marimba, and that's really, really also something that is, um, yeah, it's just it, it gives me a lot to play a with other instruments and b with other people because they all have a new approach to the music you play. I just, since I'm the guy that makes uh, weird connections, I was going to say also, if you're interested in, in percussion and tap dancing, <laughs> there's a great video of, I was trying to find the, the exact video, but it's Nexus performing in Tokyo with Steve Gadd. They do Xylophonia by uh, Joe Green. And uh, Steve Gadd is a tap dancer in addition to a drummer. And he 
he tap dances on stage. It's pretty cool to see. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it so, works. Um, well, let me pull my list of questions up here. So, uh, Manu, you have an active Patreon page, uh, and this mm -hmm. requires constant interaction with your listeners multiple times a week. Uh, on this podcast, we we share the duties of all the administrative work. So we take time turns booking guests and editing episodes and uh, making social media posts. But it seems like you have to do all this yourself. Um, and so do you find this to be a stressor or a motivator? Do you have contingency plans for those weeks when you're traveling or have multiple live engagements? And can you just tell us a bit in general about your Patreon? So yeah, the, the Patreon, um, I do most of it myself. Well, every everything that people see and hear, I do myself. What I got though is a huge amount of uh, support um, from my, my partner, my girlfriend. She, she does a lot of, you know, when I want to not quit, but when I feel like, oh, look, I, I have to cancel the next episode, she said, says come on do something do something so she does a lot of work in that way but yes the rest is um you know how it is to edit videos i mean before the the pandemic i was just a musician and now after the pandemic i have da vinci resolve on my second computer that i had to get because the graphic card on my macbook you know how it is like um video editing is a world for itself and it, it is a lot of work and for your question um is it a motivator or a stressor i would say 80 percent motivator and 20 percent stressor 20 percent as in i chose i i'm new to patreon i knew about it for several years but i never got into starting it i i needed a pandemic for that this is really true i i would never have done it without that and um i'm still learning and adapting and i'm very uh i take it relaxed because i see other people are also just checking it out and you need your mvp you just put something out there and you need to um just not be shy to do bad bad stuff i mean it can never be really bad let's be honest but if it's not the best then you just do better next time so i just chose this model with um fixed you know per month um subscription and yes it is a privilege to live in switzerland yes people in switzerland they don't shy away from giving you 10 bucks a month which in my opinion this should not be a lot of money because um, when you eat uh, at a gas station, that's also 10 bucks. So, and it works really well. I did choose to make a video every Monday called Marimba Monday. That's not a new word, but it is what it is. It's Marimba Monday where I talk about what's happening. And then Wednesday, I do a improv Wednesday where I just, uh, I have now here everything set up. I can press the button and improvise. It's usually three to five minutes. And it's so cool that I just said, I'm gonna do this every week because now what I have, actually this um, invitation to your podcast is brilliant timing because tomorrow is my one year anniversary on Patreon. So of course, I, uh, thank you. Of course, I put myself under a lot of pressure. I mean, now is Sunday uh, here, it's, almost over the Sunday. So tomorrow I will get up early. I will not sleep as much as I would like, but I'm gonna do it. I have, um, yesterday I recorded for four hours. I had um, four costume changes. I just, I mean, just changing clothes. It's like in a theater. Um, and now I have an introduction and I will do a little, um, you know, what happened um, looking back through the year. And then I have um, an outro and yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but it keeps me going. And you know, one thing, that you, one thing you said is like recording projects are always so daunting. 
And I'm sure it's one of those things like the more you do it, the more you just get used to it and it, it becomes routine. And yeah, like for me, a, a big recording project like is disassembling the instrument, moving it over to school, hiring someone to come and set up mics. And like, yeah, if it's all just set up right there, I'm sure it's a lot less yeah. of a barrier to get over. And also, I mean, every time you do a recording when you start, like you sort of hate the editing process because you're like trying to remember how to use Final Cut and like, yeah. And, yeah, like trying to figure out what how to make this cut work or whatever and like yeah i'm sure the more you do it the more it absolutely it just becomes routine absolutely looking back my first episode um i'm also going to share that tomorrow by the way the, the tomorrow uh the celebration of course will be open to the public usually it's just for patrons but because it's a celebration and um i will probably also put in some little snippets of the the old episodes and i mean it's ridiculous in the first episode i was this close to the camera it was bad lighting bad lights um i did subtitles which is ridiculous nobody can read it that fast because i i do it so far i do it in swiss german because i, I have swiss patrons so far this this is a uh, difficult i want to find international patrons but I need to learn how to advertise it better. So, um, and in the first episode, I did do a script. I made a plan and it took me 16 hours to make my first <laughs> Marimba Monday. And nowadays it's, um, sometimes it's two hours. I just have a concert, I share it. Like last week I played Peter and the Wolf, um, which is not Marimba, but I just did it. So I just shared a video. And sometimes I do bigger projects. Also due to the pandemic, sometimes nothing happened during a week. So I had to invent something. Um, so I learned to clone myself, you know, with the split screen. I did some Vivaldi where I play marimba and I whistle. I, I was I gonna ask about that. So I, that's I don't something sing. that obviously takes, it takes planning to do that, but how, like, what's your, first of all, like, do you just, the idea just pops in your head and then, did you like, how, how did you go about that? Um, sometimes it's really, you drive your car or you're doing uh, your dishes and there's some new idea. And also, I mean, I have so many projects that I never started or never finished. And I have a shelf full of ideas and sometimes I just grab something. And that was um, really easy um, to do the Vivaldi whistling and um, and playing marimba. And also that um, reminds me of w when I was younger, I did play in a theater group and I always loved to act, but I never pursued it. And now all of a sudden, I I, I feel like that that's something that's coming back. It's really fun when you have to do this schizophrenic uh, back and forth. Like I, I had to you have two screens and you bow here and you bow here and then you look to each other and say, good job, good job. And it's so funny because you, and being a percussionist, maybe it's a little bit easier to do the timing and uh, it's funny and yeah, I learned, I learned, I definitely learned more in this year than I did in the previous three years. It's uh, intense. I mean, learning what an interface is, learning how a um, ring light works and, and all that stuff. It's... Cool. Well, uh, totally changing gears from Patreon, but I remember you hearing you perform your beautiful composition, Anna, on I think your final recital in Miami. And mm -hmm. I was looking and it seems like you haven't really published any more works. So could you tell us more about that work? And then also, do you have any plans to publish more compositions? Mm -hmm. um, I, I do right now. I don't know uh, what's the next step in publishing. Um, as for this piece, Anna, um, that just literally just happened. I had, uh, obviously there was an Anna to start with. And um, I was very unfocused because of that particular person. And um, I improvised on the marimba. You know, your instrument can be a really good counsel or psychiatrist or whatever. So I improvised and it started to become music and it, I started to, to like it. And I had the courage. Oh, 
I had a project, another project where I recorded Omanium Mysterium by Marcus Paus, you know, that beautiful piece. Yeah, with um, choir, I think I saw that on your yeah, website. Yeah, with choir, with choir. I, I love that piece. So um, we recorded that. And in the end, I asked the sound engineer, can you record Anna? And that is the, the only recording in my life that I did a one take. It's just a three and a half minute piece, but still it's a one take and it's just the best version uh, I, I played of that piece. So I took this recording and sent it to Johann Switzer, who I got to know in uh, ICMA, in the Katarzyna Mitschka Academy. And he just wrote back that he listened to it 10 times and he would like to publish it. So that's how it happened. I never, this is a recurring phenomenon in, in my life and in the life of many people out there is that when you least expect it, then good things happen, but you have to have the courage to go out there. And um, then I don't know if I, I took the promotion for granted or I was just not big into, uh, I would never want to have to earn money with composing. I mean, it's a, it's a nice thing to do, but if you want to make a living from that, that's that's way harder than <laughs> performing. And um, I did get back to Johann Switzer to ask him if he would like to publish my transcription of the D minor concerto by Bach. Um, and he said, that's too big of a work. And then later on, he was too busy, I guess. So yes, I do have plans. Um, Katarzyna Michka uh, said I could maybe um, pub get, get uh, Flusterzeit, it's a, an, another piece by me, published uh, by Norsk, but I would have to write it down first. <laughs> so that's the big part. Yes, I do. Small plan. obstacle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's also, I mean, now we're in, in, a, in these times, a lot of things are changing. People are self-publishing their music on Spotify. And also, I mean, for example, Ney Rosauro, who has all his music on his own page. And I'm not sure if the future of publishing is really via the big publishing houses or if you just want to self-publish. Um, the problem with self-publishing is I don't have time to go to PASIC. I don't have time to go to promote these works. So I guess a publisher is is a good thing. It's just, um, it was not on my top priority list. <laughs> yeah, just to chime in on the, the publishing thing, um, I, I now self-publish almost 100% of the stuff I do. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it comes from using a publisher in the beginning because they already have their, their foot in the door with everybody internationally and all, you know, you go to PASIC and they're there with the booth and then people take a chance on your music and they like it. And then, um, then you can switch to self-publishing. But yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, kind of like moving to a new city and taking a gig, you move to LA and you're like, why is the phone not ringing? And it's just like, well, nobody knows you're here. And I think it's real similar mm -hmm. with publishing. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. if you self-publish from the beginning, um, nobody knows who you are, or where the website is, but um, yeah, those, those publishers can really help, especially at the the front end of the career. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear another interpretation of my one piece, Anna, um, but I haven't gotten around to, to hear it. No, that's not true. I found on YouTube, I found- There is Asian, at least one on YouTube, yeah, because I yeah, found it. A Taiwanese lady who plays Anna, and um, it's, it's really cool to hear someone else play your music. And there is more music. I did do a, uh, ah, on Facebook or Meta. Um, remember uh, when it was important to have fans on Facebook in the old days? No, I mean, um, I had, uh, I, I was approaching 1000 fans. And um, so I figured I'm gonna say thank you by composing a piece containing 1000 strokes. I, I think, I don't know if I counted just, you know, strokes or four, if that's four or just one, I don't know. But so I composed a piece and it's, uh, it, it's also on, on my YouTube channel, I think just a live outdoor recording. Um, I'm going to do a proper recording one day. 
And that turned, out, that. Yeah. that turned out really fun. So I'm sure people would play that. Mm. Some of my music is sometimes uh, very simple, very easy to learn. And some parts are probably really naughty. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to, to say how difficult or easy it is to play, but it would be fun to have some people play my music. Yeah. So, uh, Manu, you mentioned that you're going to be in the U.S. in March of 2022 at Notre Dame University. What are you, uh, what's this visit all about? So that's a, a, an idea that, that, um, that's maybe three years old. In um, 10 years ago, so 2012, um, I, I had to take a little time out and I went to South Africa to visit my cousin who was studying in Stellenbosch. He was studying the, the cello. And um, I was there for one month and I got to know his friends. And he um, had a lot of friends there because he's very sociable. And these people are, I can just say, amazing and very open um, in other than Swiss people who are a little bit shy and, you know, but South Africans. And I mean, uh, I, I got to know really different um, kinds, you know, white, colored, whatever. And they were just this big group of friends and they were so cool that I actually kept in touch with some of them um, over 10 years. I have never experienced this in my life that I would go to a country for one, for one time and then I would just keep in touch with some of these people. So um, one of uh, the, these people is um, Roshan Chakane. He's a organ player uh, from Durban. That's the, the city um, with the most Indian population. And I think he, he also has Indian and South African uh, roots. So he is now in the US and does his doctoral, how do you call it, dissertation, his DMA on this project, Oregon and Marimba. And he takes some of his roots. He takes uh, music from an Indian South African composer. And also he's going to take my transcription from, from Bach. And we're going to play. Actually, he invites me to play on his uh, lecture recital. And we use this opportunity. It's actually a win-win because he can make his doctoral, uh, his finish his paper, and I get to to play an international project because that's something that's missing in my life. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a celebrity. I'm not a big. I'm not famous. I don't have these international collaborations yet. So uh, again, talking about the business side of the beginning, nobody gets famous by just sitting, uh, which is not a goal of mine. But nobody gets, you know, um, outside like you, Xenia. You were what to Russia and Poland, and you need to. Yeah, you need to just make it happen. So I figured, why not go to the US, play this project with him? We're gonna play the, the recital with Oregon and Marimba. And then we're gonna add three or four concerts in the vicinity of his, uh, well, of Notre Dame. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. I just renewed my passport. So fingers crossed that we're not gonna have a a problem with you know what um i hope i can go there it's in february uh 23rd to march 20th so almost one month and i'm really looking forward to be there again and i'm gonna maybe see asia again that's a, a friend ben and ben and i you know her too xenia yes we all know asia how how yeah. can we not? yeah she's a buddy yeah. so i hope i hope to see her again maybe i can add some more people to yeah it would be fun to see you too ben i know that texas and chicago is yeah not the closest in the world yeah. not really you, uh, you've you recorded correct me if i'm wrong didn't you record a whole album of marimba and organ several yes. years ago yes. so what what do you think is uh what works about that combination or what's appealing about that combination marimba and organ uh, Okay, for one, I love the combination of an instrument that is uh, has a short note like marimba, you have dong, 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 and then the organ is the exact opposite. 
being like basically like a choir for me an organ is like a choir you have these different voices and you have the sustain um i love that i love the the different registers that you can have a, a full orchestra by the way the idea of that cd was i want to play marimba concerti but i don't have orchestras because again you get orchestras when you have a name. <laughs> so um, I just figured I, I need a one woman orchestra. So I, I got um, this concert possibility with this Japanese woman, uh, Yoshiko Mazaki. We're gonna have our 10 year anniversary next year. So we're gonna play uh, some more concerts. And with her, it was just fun. It's, it, it works. What is also appealing, the marimba, even though, if, even though it's perfectly pitched and they do a great job of um, tuning it. It's never really in tune. Like when you when you play with violinists, they always say like, what, what, what is happening with the overtones? And the same with organ. I feel they both are a little bit dirty instruments, if that's possible to say on a podcast. It's just, um, it, it molds uh, into one, it's really working out great. I was curious, you said uh, the shortness of marimba with organ. Uh, I'm sure, I'm, I mean, I've heard your albums and, and others of marimba and organ. But I always would imagine that, you know, organs always being in big churches, there would be the issue of the marimba reverb plus the organ reverb and everything getting real muddy together. On, on this recording, of course, we had, I mean, you can put, you can place the microphones mm -hmm. really close to the organ. Of course, it's different when you play in a big cathedral probably gets a little bit, uh, what did you call it, muddy. Uh, we also had this, um, you know, when you play with organs, they are usually on a uh, balcony and sometimes the, the marimba doesn't fit. So we also had this situation where we would play, um, she would play here and I would play 20 meters uh, away. And that's a great experience, by the way. You have to learn that the the audience who's in the middle has to hear both at the same time. And this is a, a perfect exercise for playing together. Organ and marimba that are several feet apart, that's, um, that's a cool experience. It's a little bit, um, it's not so fun to play because you're all the time um, doing some Steve Reich uh, shifting stuff, but in the middle it's together. And that's, that's a great uh, exercise. You know, you mentioned our friend Asiya, and you also mentioned one person orchestra. I wanted to mention that uh, Asiya has just this mind blowing transcription of Richard Strauss's Ein Heldenleben, uh, which is a 50 minute long, beautifully scored orchestra work that she plays on piano from memory alone. It's just, it makes me feel small <laughs> as a human <laughs> being to be in to be in Asiya's presence. And I remember she played that on a recital along with the Bach Chaconne, uh, and maybe one other piece. Um, and I mean, that's just where yeah, I just feel small around her. <laughs> yeah, she's a monster. Yeah, she's a monster. She is a, a big inspiration to all of us, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Ksenia, I think we had an Instagram question. Uh, yes, we did. So Jesse Gula, thank you, Jesse, for your question. Uh, asked Manu, how do you decide what concerti to learn? Just regarding concerti. Yeah. Um, how, how do I decide? Well, just if I love it or not. <laughs> if I, right now I'm, I'm, Learn relearning the Sejourné Concerto. I can play it next year, but I never played the, 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 the Marimba Concerto. That is, yeah, the Marimba Concerto. And yeah. I never, I never played the first movement of the the later edition. So that's new to me. And um, I just love his music. It's it's so I don't know speaks speaks to the, from and to the heart. I I love it. And um, I don't get it's it's a cool question. Um, the thing is, I don't get to play solo concerti that often. Um, I, I had a, a question to sort of tack on to this. Do you ever take into consideration uh, the accompaniment, whether there's a piano reduction available or not, whether it's for strings only or full orchestra, whether it's, there's a band transcription? Is that ever a concern? 
Because I know for a lot of at least American university students, when they enter a concerto competition, there has to be a band version of it available, or they have to be able to play it with piano. So are those ever considerations you make? Um, actually, I work the other way around. I, I wait until an uh, opportunity occurs where I can play with somebody and then we choose the piece. Like for example, ne next, um, we had this year, we had a premiere, there was a, a new orchestra was founded, the Swiss Symphonic Wind Orchestra. Because in, in Switzerland, we have a big scene uh, in, in wind ensembles, but it's not like in the US, they are a little bit, you know, the, the, the little dwarfs. It's always, oh, classical orchestras, and then there's the, the wind orchestras. And they want to change that image because we actually have um, great literature and there's some really good players. Also, a lot of them like amateur players who are really, really good on the trumpet and horn. So they founded this orchestra and I played in the percussion section and I used this opportunity again, business thinking to just talk to the conductor and ask him if we could do something with marimba and this orchestra. And because it's the Swiss Symphonic Wind Orchestra, they, um, they uh, have to or want to play Swiss compositions. And since there is no Swiss composer who has composed the piece for that setting, we're just gonna make some adaption uh, transcriptions and then that's how I choose. It's not like I'm sitting in my practice room and I feel I want to learn Alfred Reed concert or I want to learn, um, I don't even know all the marimba concerti because I figured this is not something I'm gonna put my focus on because it's just too rare, the opportunities. It's uh, usually, it's still on my bucket list to play with a professional orchestra, for example. So far, I only perform with, with uh, amateur orchestras. And um, it's usually a lot of work, a lot of rehearsals, and then you only have two concerts and then it's done. So- Yeah, I, I mean, like, you think you bring up a good point. Unless you're Evelyn Glennie, you don't need 20 different concertos in your back pocket. You, you, exactly. You make the rounds. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there, there are, violinists out there, there are pianists out there, they have on Friday evening, they play Rachmaninoff second, on Saturday they play Brahms first and so on, then it makes sense. But in, in my uh, case, um, it's more that when I get the opportunity to play with an orchestra, then I have the pieces I would like to play. I have Rosauro that I don't want to play anymore because it's a lovely piece, but we have, we have new pieces nowadays. One of my big dreams, of course, you can probably guess it, is to one day play my own concerto. That's just a huge monster project. I have a lot of ideas, melodies and patterns. I work mostly in, in patterns, um, but I would need some, some help because the whole, to compose a, let's say 20 minutes solo concerto, that's, uh, uh, that's big. What I had, I don't know if you if you saw it on YouTube, I had in 2018, uh, a friend of mine composed a piece for orchestra marimba. And he did that based on a poem by another friend of mine. And it actually turned out really, really cool. It's, uh, it's on, What's it's on YouTube. Called? Is it just concerto for marimba and orchestra? The composer's name is Simon Scheibiller. Okay, cool. Simon, Simon. It Simon does say, Scheibler. yeah, just concerto for marimba. I think just concerto. I thought it had, because it's based on this poem and it's a lovely poem about, you know, about dreams and goals and targets. And if you're still on the track and he composed it really like this poem where you lose track of your way and then it's, it gets chaotic. And yeah, it's, it's a nice addition. But again, um, it was this once this one opportunity and I never got to play it again ever since. So for now, I'm not really um, pursuing that. I'm also not um, promoting myself. Like when you go to my website, I don't write Manuel Leuenberger, the, the soloist. I'm, I'm the marimba artist because I want to make art with the marimba. And that can be literally anything. 
that can be with tap dance that can be my my glow rimba idea you know where i play in the dark with the illuminous uh mallets yeah well uh manuel thank you so much for stopping by all the way from switzerland it was a pleasure to see you uh and thank we, you. Uh, we need to chat more often it's, it's been too long and yes, uh, thank you so please. much to all of our listeners and we will see you on episode 309